Good afternoon, members. Um, I welcome you all for uh, this second session. Uh, can I uh, request Rejo, our MC member, to escort CA KS Ravi, sir, onto the desk and welcome him with a floral bouquet? Thank you, Rejo. It's my proud privilege to introduce uh, this uh, session's speaker, CAKS Ravi, sir. CAKS Ravi is a BSc graduate in physics, chemistry, and mathematics. Was intending to do PhD in mathematics. He deviated to do CA course. After his articleship, he got employed with C and AG and quit the job even before completing the CA course. He wanted to be independent and therefore decided to quit the job. Immediately after quitting, he got himself qualified and set up his own practice in a small way, which has now grown into a decent office consisting of 10 chartered accountants, two company secretaries and two cost accountants, having their own certificate of practice working under a single roof with 38 article students and other staff. The firm has branches at Chikmagaluru and Kasargod. He has strictly followed best practice methods in his profession and the same being com complied with by his partners and other staff in the firm. He has been running this firm for last 32 years. He is a paper contributor to journals like The Chartered Accountant, The Chartered, the Chartered Secretary, Bombay Chartered Accountants Journal, Corporate Law Advisor, Taxman Current Tax Reporter, The Management Accountants, Service Tax Review and Excise Law Times. So far, he has contributed about 40 articles to above journals. He has continuously taken weekly classes on subjects to his colleagues and other staff members over a period of 15 years. He has also tutored students in-house to aid them in taking up C examination. He is also an eminent speaker who regularly delivers lectures, on, uh, lectures at Income Tax Department, Member Audit Board, Accountant Audit and Accountant General Office, Fiscal Policy Institute and Public Sector Undertakings. He is a consultant for producer companies and large number of NGOs. Apart from this, Sir is a passionate philatelist and numismatist and he has been collecting them from his childhood. Sir is currently engaged in learning Sanskrit and reading various philosophical books apart from updating his knowledge on the professional front. With this brief introduction, I present before you CAKS Ravi Sir. Over to you Sir. Good morning to all of you. Yeah. I should thank people who are listening to me, people who have given me this opportunity to speak to you. It's great. And I think, though I've been in the profession for the last 33 years, I'm coming before you for the first time. Right. I could have done that long back, but then I was busy in setting up my office, developing it, bringing people, nurturing them. So I thought if I have to do justice, I must be free. Today I'm totally free. I've retired from practice, though I still guide people. But then that's where I am. Because I had to draw my line. I knew what I was supposed to do as I kept developing the profession now I just left it to the other partners to run the show. Therefore, I have enough time. But then I'm still active. I do a lot of things. And there's no exception. There's no Sunday for me. That's how I've uh, set up this profession. At least I was there all the seven days doing my work sincerely. And therefore, in spite of all the difficulties and being straight, I've been able to set up this office. Now, coming back to the subject, topic 
you would prefer that we dialogue it's better that we talk to each other i'm not giving you a lecture all of us are equally competent you learn from me or i learn from you it's a good method of talking to people i don't lecture i talk so that's where we are related party transactions it may appear to be a dry area but then it's important for people in the profession i think we cannot ignore so therefore if people don't like me talking don't feel hesitant if people want to go to sleep please do that but only things that i request you that you don't disturb the next neighbor by snoring right that's all that i expect without snores if people want to go to sleep it's fine if people go to sleep then i think i have not achieved my objectives i must keep you awake that's my job right okay now related party now first of all what strikes you when you talk about related party what's important if i ask that question how do you think that you look at it and how can you really establish that a person is related these are some of the issues but what is the principle under which we are looking at related party transactions so what's the principle what's the basic principle can anybody tell me why are we looking at related party transactions what really prompts us to look at related party transactions and why are we in it what's the reason possibility of biasness can you put it a little more professionally so that we understand what we mean when you say bias bias yes very good one of the factors is arm's length i agree the other one when you say arm's length i think it has answered all our questions see if it was anybody else in public i will explain what is arm's length but all of us understand what is arm's length correct are we clear we are clear about what is arm's length we are talking about arm's length price one more issue which is often repeated when you talk about related party transaction in the ordinary course of business these are two elements that you should keep in mind when you are talking about related parties is it in the ordinary course of business first issue then is it at arm's length price two issues that you will have to consider when you are talking about related parties are we clear right i move forward now related party what does it mean it means different things to different people do we agree whether we agree or not the manner in which it has been dealt with by different sections of law or the standards it says we look at it differently of course there are commonalities as well now company law looks at it from an one angle then the other is lodr what is lodr yes listing obligations and disclosure requirements under sebi in respect of listed companies section sorry accounting standard 18 speaks with a particular language india s24 speaks with a particular language look at that the law itself the standards themselves look at it from different angles and as human beings we tend to look at it from that angle therefore we have to strictly go through the principles enshrined in each one of them to be able to say what is related what is not related and what should be the disclosure requirements why do we want disclosure requirements the reason being we have to be above board we have to tell public or the reader of the financial statement or the legal authorities or the legal entities to say that we have disclosed what is supposed to have been disclosed and we have done it at in the ordinary course of business and arms length principle so that there is nobody else who lose out of such type of transactions for at the benefit of somebody somebody else right these are the requirements and therefore related party transactions are looked at in a particular way and then disclosures are made so therefore it casts great amount of responsibility on auditors to be able to report on them and therefore we should understand what it really means 
That's the sum and substance of all your related party transactions. Right? Now, director or his relative? Do we understand what's a director? How has it been defined in the company law? Can everybody tell me? Not properly defined at all, but still we understand what a director is. Look at that. Companies Act says something about a director. One who is a director is a director. So, director or his relative. Now, who are these relatives? We'll get into that a little later. Key management personnel. I think we understand key management personnel. Do we understand? Yeah, key management personnel. Who are they? CEO, CFO, correct? So, these are all people. Other than being directors who are at the helm of affairs, a group or a set of people who come together to take decisions, who are important for the purpose of taking decision, who do day-to-day -day, day -day activities. These are all people who are there. Firm in which the director, manager, relative is a partner. Firm in which the director, manager, relative is a partner. Very clear. Things are very clear. Now, what is a director? I've already stated, not much of a description, but we know who is a director. Because anybody who forms part of the board, board of directors, is a director. That's how the company law mentions. We all understand it because we have been in and out of that. But if you ask a common man, probably he'll be perplexed to understand. They all understand, not that they don't understand, but then you need a proper definition, and this is the definition which is there. Firm in which the director, manager, relative is a partner. Now you're talking about manager. Who is a manager? Who can be a manager? Company law says, a person who is not a managing director or a whole-time director, in that place if you put a person who is not a director at all, that fellow is a manager, that person is a manager. See, all these are very clear. So you need to, words may be there. But then you have to understand the words because we have to understand practical situations when it comes how to apply. Then a private limited company in which director, manager, relative is a member or a director. We understand who is a member, shareholder or a director, related party gets established. A public limited company in which the director, manager is a director, stops there and goes further and tells and holds with his relatives more than 2% of share capital. So what happens? If you are a director or a manager, definitely you will get covered. But if you want to cover the relatives in the case of public limited company, they must be holding shares to the extent of 2% or more, otherwise they get eliminated. We just run through, but then where do you stop? What do you break? What do you consider? What you don't consider? These are issues that has to be taken into consideration. Practical situations will come. And therefore, we normally what I have seen is, even though in the case of public limited company, less than 2% shares are held, relatives also get covered and they are also mentioned, which is not true. So therefore, we have to look into that. Then any body corporate whose board of directors, MD, manager is accustomed to act. What is that? It is the object of significant influence. If you've got something to influence, the decisions taken by the board of directors, the managing director, then again, related party transaction comes into picture. Then again, advice, directions. There it was body corporate, here it is person. Either the significant influence will come from another company or it will come from a person, an individual. Could be a director, could be a managing director, could be outside the company, all that. So related party transactions will set in. Then any company which is holding, which is a holding company, subsidiary, associate. Then you need to understand what's a holding company, what's a subsidiary, what's an associate. Right? Most of us understand, not that we don't understand, but then it has to be crystal clear, sharply diagnosed to be able to understand what they really mean. Then you have, by virtue of investments and by virtue of being a venturer, right? Do that investment and if the reporting company becomes, if the reporting becomes an associate, then again, related party transactions will set in. Other companies that may be prescribed, I think the last one came because of a prescription. You have a venturer or you have a investment company which invests and that becomes an associate that has come in 
uh, as an addition to the existing list. Then it also says units of body corporates, private limited or unlisted public limited companies in IFSC or SCZ are outside the ambit of related party transactions because they've been given relief or flexibility of not being treated as related party. So transactions will not get covered, right? So this is with respect to related parties. Now, do you want to raise any question on some of these issues? Or you want me to continue further? You want me to go further? Yeah, I can go forward. Yeah, please. Correct. Let me tell you, you get accustomed in the sense, there is a supplier who does the maximum supply and therefore, or there's a customer who takes from you expecting you to do in a particular way, in a particular manner and you get accustomed to it over a period of time because you, he's, the, he's the main supplier or customer and therefore you start believing his methods because your market is he or it and therefore you have a significant influence on the company in which you are buying or selling and that becomes a related party transaction to be reported. You get accustomed, you get used to it because there are directions and based on the directions they come sit in the board and start taking decisions. Now, are there directions? No, these are all practical issues that you have to interpret and say, has there been something that I will have to report? There could be many more issues that can come up in a practical situation and not all of them can be provided for. But the question is, does it fit into the definition which is there? Then I have to be cautious to be able to report. A lot of things you will have to, because judgment, ultimately it's judgment that you have to take, the call that you have to take, right? In spite of there being no transactions, you may have to report on the related parties, right? So this is how it goes. Who is a relative? Very interesting. Because the relative from the point of view of Companies Act and those with respect to accounting standards could differ. So what do you do? There, there can be a difference. Let us take India's, 20, uh, India's 24. You've got a definition there. Companies, has, Companies Act has got a definition. You know that you will have to follow the provisions of India's for companies with net worth and all those requirements. Now you have one one hand the law which is company as act, which has got a restricted definition, and then you've got an exhaustive definition under the NDS. What do you do? What do you do? do you go, are you going to stick to only what is in the company's act? The other way would be to take the most exhaustive definition and exhaust it completely so that you are safe. I'm not even looking at safety. That is the principle. Always as auditors, I don't think we look for safety. We look for principles so that it can be argued at any point of time. All of us look at safety. That is not the issue. For me, it's a strict belief and a belief that you believe and therefore you state. That should be the method. Therefore, cover the exhaustive so that you are clear, you are protected as well without even thinking. And that's the basis of your practice, right? So you have all members of HUF. Are they relatives? Yes, they are relatives. This HEF doesn't get reflected in your India's. Do you agree with me? Does it get reflected? Yes. Why? Why HDF doesn't get reflected uh, in India's? Because those things have not been prepared by us. Correct? It has been prepared elsewhere. They don't understand HEF. Only here in India we understand what is HEF. Companies that covers it. And therefore, even though NDS does not cover that, you will have to pick up this from Company Act and then say, I will include this as well. See, look at that. Then India speaks about domestic partner. Do we speak about domestic partners at all? Now, what's a domestic partner? So you have to understand that. That comes from the West. It may slowly percolate into India as well. Because culturally, we are almost there. Like we are willing to accept, adopt NDS or the accounting standard as a matter of fact also comes from outside. It was already there. 
because the accounting standard that I'm speaking about when I was trying to qualify myself, I think there are only two accounting standards then. I was so lucky. But today I go and speak about India's also, I go and speak about AS also because that's where I have arrived. It's not just what the profession has given me, I have to go much beyond. And therefore, you should try to understand even if HUF is not there in India's, you will have to get covered because complete. So you make mix of all that and take the exhaustive so that you are clear that you have covered everything. Right? Then you have husband and wife, obviously. Correct? Relative. Father, mother, yes. Interesting issue. When you say father, mother, it includes stepfather, stepmother as well. It will come down. So, okay? Sons and son's wife. Daughter and daughter's husband. Brother and sister. Stepfather and stepmother. Step son. Stepdaughter is not included. Why? God knows. So, when you have a relationship, related party transaction, you have a daughter and a stepfather, it will get covered. But you have got a father and a stepdaughter, it will never get covered. One way it gets covered, the other way it doesn't get covered. No, let me tell you, will this become practical? No, don't worry about practicality. Understand the principle. Why did it not get covered? God knows. It may come, it may not come. That's a secondary issue. But the law states certain things and let's accept that and then say, what happened? Where was this issue? Got the point? You have a daughter and a stepfather gets covered for related party transaction. But you have a father and a stepdaughter doesn't get covered because stepdaughter is not there. Stepdaughter can still transact and then say it's outside the related party transaction. Now, if it is rule based, I will say that. But if you ask me principally, I would still say it's a related party transaction. Right. Now, interestingly, what has happened between 1956 Act and 2013 Act is grandparents not covered for related party. Grandchildren not covered for related party. Right? Not covered. That's it. Then you have, uh, I've said all that. See, you see, brother's wife, sister's husband has been left out. Right, that's it. These are the issues. Now, the, the way you look at a particular law, you have to find out what are the gaps that are existing there. Not that we have to suggest to somebody there's a gap and you take benefit of that. That's not the intention. But then understand the law in such a way that it gives you pleasure to understand why did they miss this? Of course, with respect to grandparents and grandchildren, deliberately 2013 Act has eliminated. So you should not worry about it. That's okay. Directors, another interesting issue which comes up here. We, we say directors are related parties. We have accepted that. Is it not? We have stated in the first definition part itself. Executive directors, covered. Who are executive directors? Directors who are involved in day-to-day -day activities, apart from that, draw their salaries or remuneration. Then you've got independent directors. Are they covered? According to me, look at why independent directors gets covered. When you look at one of the notifications that has come, all types of directors are included while determining related party, which has not been defined clearly under that section 234 doesn't go to 234, it doesn't properly define that. And director is a person who has been appointed to the board of the company. That is the definition which is given. Then apart from that, the company set says, if he is an independent director of a holding company, he is exempted from being called as a related party. That means what? Director of a holding company, a key management person of a holding company will get covered for a subsidiary. But independent director of a holding company does not get covered for the subsidiary. But what happens to the in independent director of a subsidiary, if you ask me the question, since there is no clarification, independent director for the company which is reporting gets covered. That's one more issue that you should remember, that in case of an independent director of holding company is not a related party, whereas independent director of that company itself which is going to report is a related party. Because of the lacuna which is there in the language of the sections and the notifications and all that, right. 
then you have additional director who is an additional director until the next agm you holds office is an additional director then you got a nominee director managing director full time director non executive director non executive director also not receiving any remuneration but working on a day to day basis could be a related party because what happens they come as directors take no remuneration but they enter into transactions where the benefits are given elsewhere possibility is there and therefore they get covered right so again like i told you director means a director appointed to the board of a company you and i can understand what it means but is that definition sufficient but that is the definition 234 right then key management personnel i have already discussed with you ceo md manager company secretary full time director cfo others as prescribed that means who get involved in trying to take decisions on behalf of the company may get involved then group of people who are at the helm of affairs of a company almost described as first point of contact for people who are transacting with the company dealing with the company that will be the first point of contact i have already told you what's a manager and all that so i don't want to get into that body corporate any foreign company which is in india will get covered includes a company incorporated outside india what is not included is only the cooperative societies under the cooperative society act will not get covered but all otherwise a body corporate is one which gets registered and therefore by virtue of registration if you talk about societies in the society registration act if you talk about trust they don't come here it's only cooperative societies which is there and they say that gets eliminated associate company 20% or more of the total share capital or you have a significant influence where that significant influence is to the extent of 20% or more is not a subsidiary company that means what is not a subsidiary but you got significant influence is one and the other is holding 20% of the paid up share capital two of this will get covered under an associate is that fine i am still covering on the definition section control because all these words are going to come into your related party transactions you really need to understand what it means and where do you go back you go back to the definitions to understand what exactly each word means and once you have clarity on your words you are very clear what transactions will get covered what transactions will not get covered the right to appoint majority of the directors is control because control joint control significant influence these are three words which are again important right to control the management or policy decisions exercised by a person or persons acting individually or in concert that means whatever decisions are going to be taken you are influencing those decisions and therefore there is a control absolute control difference between significant influence and absolute control is in the case of absolute control your decisions will prevail and you will make the group or set of people to behave accordingly significant influence you may influence their decisions but ultimately decisions are taken by them you are not actually controlling it this is how you have to make a distinction between significant influence and then control yes please yes please yes section 8 is covered under related party transaction section 8 is a company yes so long as it is registered under ministry of corporate affairs right they will all be covered under related party transactions in C correct even if it is an university okay one by one let us try to understand now what are you now trying to ask me is a question now for the section 8 company as a reporting company it could be a related party transaction but for the autonomous institution it may not be a related party transaction reason being it it is but the reason being reporting requirements or the formalities to be observed will not apply to the aut autonomous body but will apply to section 8 is that okay i will be very happy if you intervene and raise a question i will still be happy my flow of thought will still continue okay right 
So what are the transactions which are, which are in the ambit of RPT? Very clear, specific to the core. So we all know what are transactions, correct? We know what are transactions. Any transaction will get covered. But then you have to make a distinction between what is material and what is not material. Again, I will speak about that a little later. I've got sale, purchase, leasing, supply of material, services. You just have to classify. They have given it in different uh, clauses, but then I have grouped it. Then intangible, movable or immovable. What is not covered? Have you covered everything? Okay, we'll deliberate on that a little later, don't worry. Then it talks about appointment. First is transactions which takes place per se. Second one is with respect to appointment, appointment of any agent to do all these activities. That's the second category. Purchase, sale, material, services, property, whatever you want to say. Then the next one is underwriting the subscription of any security or derivatives of a different character altogether. One is direct transaction. Second one is appointment of agents. Third one is underwriting. Fourth one is appointment of people to positions either in the company, the reporting company itself, or in the subsidiary, or in the associate company. Is that okay? Now what is not covered? What doesn't get covered? Everything is covered? Okay. Now, we are talking about transactions. Now, can we understand what's a transaction? What's a transaction? Very easy. It's any event which is with a consideration, which can be converted into monetary terms. Is a transaction, you agree with me? No. There can be events which are not transactions. So, what do you want to do? I'll give you an example. I have a machinery without taking any consideration. I have given that machinery for use to my subsidiary for about six months. Is it a transaction? It is a transaction. I will say there is no money consideration at all. I can't record it in my books of accounts. Can I record it? A transaction is capable of being recorded in the books of accounts, but an event cannot be recorded, but then there is a benefit which is being derived with the subsidiary. Although it does not reflect it in my financial statements, my disclosures will have to indicate that. That's where the auditor has to be standing and looking at things because it's not at arm's length. Now, what is arm's length? We'll come to that a little later. Look at that and look at the sensitivity that you should have to be able to capable of understanding. So then you need to understand what's a transaction, what's an event, is there a benefit to all those issues? Is that clear? And that's the level at which you should think. That's the level. There is no other level. You have to think, think through completely to be able to reflect it correctly. We had a problem recently with CNDG. There was stamp duty relief given, which was not reflected in the books of accounts. But then there's a benefit derived. It was in the form of a grant. He said, we have to reflect it. They were not willing to accept it. He said, you can do what you want. We know what we have done, then they have to withdraw. Because I come from CNDG, I know what it is. I have to be strong enough to state what I want to state with substantial reasons, right? Ordinary course of business. How do you understand what's ordinary course of business? Who takes a decision of ordinary course of business? How do you do it? People can say ordinary course of business. What all will you look at? We will say there is objective in memorandum of association. Can it be sufficient? Not sufficient. Not sufficient. Then what will I look at? Ordinary course of business. My policies. I have policies in my company. I look at my policies. I look at my regular methods of working. I will look at all the board decisions which are there. And I start looking at whether this is the way the company works. Based upon that, I start taking decisions. That's ordinary course of business. A lot of things can happen. Your object is tight, but then there can be subsidiaries to those particular tight uh, objectives. Then you start looking at it, find out whether in the ordinary course of business. So case laws are already there. There are many of them. One of them is here. So to decide what is OCB, one needs to depend on MOA, not sufficient, or 
policy of the company further the audit committee or the board in the absence of audit committee why does this or absence of audit committee i'll come to that a little later just forget about it for the time being then arms length price what do you understand by arms length price what is it we understand arms length price all of us very clear do we understand what is it third party transactions you are comparing a third party transactions to find out whether it's arms length but first of all let me understand what is arms length that which is not influenced by any factors that is arms length i can go on it's a half half a, a days discussion how arms length so where do you go and fall back to find out what is arms length where do you get a clue of trying to find out what is arms length now go back to all your laws 92c correct what is it arms length transaction is going to be decided there are methods please look at that and then find out what is arms length yeah they are also they tell you how you should try to do it there are methods to find out whether it is arms length or not comparable uncont uncontrolled price method profit split method resale price method transaction net margin method then one more is there what is that cost plus addition cost plus price uh, cost plus profit right all these have to be taken care you have to look at it from that angle whether it is related party within the country or related party international you have all these methods are already there then also price charged if you want, don't want to do that they have one more which they have added price charged or to be paid payable if you are able to compare that with the third party transaction so that's how the board will have to go through this to come to its own conclusion okay right then wherever of course valuation is not a must but if it's an immovable property definitely you will ask for a valuation so look at practical issues that we that may be looked into to find out what is this now why is it important either you may be sitting as an independent director in a board or you may doing be doing audit and expecting certain at least responses from the management you can raise some of these issues to come to your own conclusion judgment ultimately should prevail preferential allotment of shares i think something was being spoken in the morning regarding private placement correct right preferential allotment of shares whether it's a related party transaction at all now we start looking at examples and then are testing whether we have understood the concepts so what do we do section 195 and 186 of the companies act is specifically covering the act of providing corporate guarantee right or including preferential issue of shares okay but then we are dealing with 188 we are not dealing with 185 and 186 correct yeah. related party transaction deals with 188 then you have another section which is dealing with 185 185 and 186 now when you have issues coming up like this should i look at it from the angle of section 185 and 186 or should i look at it from the angle of section 188 what do you do what do you do see these are things what people generally speak i don't think we need to worry about it people generally speak and we know what it is but when you have subtle issues coming up how do you pick up that subtle issue to be able to answer that with the given law the law says that anything that is specific will prevail over the general 185 and 186 are specific sections now why are we asking this question i can as well deal with with 185 and 186 or i can deal with 188 i will simply say i'll deal with 185 and 186 the reason for that is your requirements under section 188 doesn't have to be adhered to when you are looking at a specific section you are out of that now you want to report under 188 also you want to report in 185 186 also it shows that we are not fully aware of what the law really intends i will simply say it's section 185 186 i will not go through the process that's why you have to understand what is the process is it a cumbersome process i will just avoid because i know there are enough controls 
there are enough security while applying 185 and 186. I don't have to fall under 188 again. Have you got the point? That's the point of trying to push home this particular example to say 188 should not prevail when specific provisions are already there. Right? Unless somebody wants to ask a question here. You want to contradict me, please do. We can debate. Specific always, most of the laws, specific will prevail over the general. Without hesitation, you can go ahead under that. Right. Officer place of profit. What does it actually mean? That means you are eligible for certain benefits, but if you get more than that, then what happens? It's an office or a place of profit. Let's take an example. A managing director. He gets his salaries. How do how does he get his salary? You go to section 197. There's a nomination and remuneration committee. It is decided. It's done. Then the managing director comes back with a transaction, either for himself or his relative, and they transact with the company. It is not in your NDR decision making process. And then you do the transaction. Will it become a related party transaction? I will say yes, because there can be benefits associated with that. Whether really such benefits are there with respect to such transactions, one. Second is you place a person who is a relative in that particular place. All others will get bonus of two months salary, but this person gets four months salary. That means it is not in accordance with the provisions that is generally applicable. There is a place of profit. There is an additional benefit over and above what he should get. Additional benefit over and above the qualification that he has got. That comes under office or place of profit. And that becomes a related party transaction. Is that okay? Yeah. Next. Corporate guarantee, whether it gets covered. Holding company gives corporate guarantee to the subsidiary. Is it a related party transaction? Yes, 185 and 186 will cover. Section 185 and 186 of the Companies Act specifically covering corporate guarantee. Why should it come under 188? It will not come under 188. Report it under 185, 186 the way it has to be reported. Because your CARO is going to ask about 188 and all that. There you have to be specific which section you are going to use. Correct? Officer place of profit, I think I have covered. Yeah. Yes. Specifically, the act says, specifically, the remuneration drawn, right? The remuneration drawn. If it is as per the terms and conditions and it has been properly negotiated by the NR committee, and if it's understood that it's not a place of profit, Salary does not get covered under related party transactions to be reported, except that, of course, key management personnel we are going to report separately. Right? You don't have to go through the report. disclosure is required, but the, you don't have to go through a process because NR committee has already taken care of that. Correct? That's the first answer. Second part of it is telling he is a consultant. So anything that a person does as a consultant, so long as it is according to the market norms, it cannot be a related party transaction. In his professional capacity, if he renders, it will not a related party so long as it, we do not establish play, office or place of profit. Am I clear? It is not a related party transaction, not a place, office or place of profit. Act is very clear on that. You look at all the uh, office or place of profit, one small line comes in which says, this does not apply to professionals. So long as other doctors are getting something less and he's getting more. There I will say, no, you've gone beyond that. Got the point? Right. You have to, you have to, you have no choice. You will have to do all that. That's the exercise of an auditor. Now, what will I do as an auditor if you ask me? I look at controls, I look at principles, I look at methods, I look at policies. If all of them are in place, I don't have to do in-depth verification. If that is not in place, then it is our responsibility and duty to be able to get into that. 
Is that okay? Right. Now, I have got leasing, which is covered under related party transaction. But then, sorry, it's not leave, but it is lease. Ah, okay. Leave and license is okay? Okay. Leasing is also. Leave and license is okay. Leave and license is one thing. There's a, when you look at leasing, leasing gets covered under related party transaction. But leave and license, is it covered? If you ask me that question, how will you answer? The answer to that is, you should have clarity whether leasing, leave and license are one and the same. Do they mean the same? If they mean the same, then they will get covered. If they don't mean the same, they will not get covered. Have you got my point? Am I clear? Can somebody at least guess? Covered, not covered. So, what is leasing? You, go, you give control, right of use, interest in a property, or any equipment, any machinery. That is leasing. That means once you give, I have to only get consideration. He uses it the way he wants. Control is there. But in the case of leave and license, it's not like that. You don't give control. You don't give right. You don't transfer right. What do you do? You only give him permission to do certain acts. Suppose, let us say a painter comes. Okay? You enter into an agreement. He does the painting. He has been given a license to paint. He can't now litigate anything. He has to only act. But in the case of leasing, he will have the power to do all this. Transfer of interest, transfer of right, ownership, modifications, all that he can do. Now, we look at it only from the point of view of building. Almost most of us believe leasing, leave and license agreements are the same. Relatively, yes, practically it comes like that. But if you go to machinery, the whole scenario changes. Therefore, you have to look at it from an overall angle and then come to a decision. Okay? Hey, look at it. How, how interesting it becomes when you go deeper and deeper. And once you understand that, it's all simple. That's all. You have reached your mile. There are two subsidiaries which are located outside India. Right? They are located outside India. Two subsidiaries, holding companies in India. They enter into a transaction. What should I do here as a holding company? What should I do? See, look how interesting things come. These are all practical utilities that we see. What happens when two subsidiaries outside the country transact with each other as a holding company? What should I do? The issue is, we don't go through any procedure at all. Because you are not actually transacting. They are transacting outside India. But reporting requirements, especially with respect to India S24, will be there. So you have to take care of reporting requirements, telling that there has been related party transactions, but between two subsidiaries which are outside India, and that reporting has to go on. But then you have to go through audit committee meeting, one. Do you have to go through director's meeting? Should you get the approval of the shareholders? Those issues will not be there. That's the difference. Only reporting as against action and reporting. Right. Buyback of shares. Again, buyback section 68.5a is a scheme made applicable to existing shareholders, providing an equal opportunity to all of them. All of them. All the shareholders are getting the same treatment. So what more do you want when the shareholders themselves have accepted that? Correct. You have a buyback arrangement. Therefore, it falls outside the purview of, though it is a related party transaction, but does not get attracted under Section 188. See, how oh, very clear. Things are very clear and you have to just understand. Once you understand, then any type of example, any practical issues coming up, you'll know how to handle it because you know the principles well. And most of our India situations or IFRS situations are all principle-based. And once we understand that, you know to what extent we have responsibilities and how do we look at those principles to interpret becomes important. Every subtle issue will get covered. Right. Approval of shareholders. Now the question is, I may cut short there. When do you require approval of shareholders? When do you require approval of the board? When do you require approval of the audit committee? And when remuneration committee has got a, a greater sway, a greater control when compared to audit committee. These are some of the issues which needs to be discussed. Right? Somebody should stop me if time is getting out. At least 
five minutes before, please try to inform me so that I know how to wind up. Right. If I keep talking, I need one full day. I've got several issues to be discussed. But then let's stop somewhere, ex except that all of us are opening up to situations that nothing is simple, and therefore we need to deal with every situation that comes in a great in-depth way, and that gives you great amount of satisfaction. I will tell you, you reach to such standards that you are so perfect that you are happy at the end of the day that you have discovered something and then it is there. Doesn't matter who looks at it, who doesn't look at it. That is secondary. What is the outcome is not important. But what is our responsibility? Have we discharged it? That gives you great amount of pleasure. And that's where we are. Right? So, first of all, please understand that with respect to any transaction which is related party transaction, it has to go through audit committee. Has to, has to. Now, is there a question when I make this statement? I'm telling you that all transactions have to go through audit committee. I'm making a statement. Is there a question from your side when I make this statement? Yes? No, I agree. All that we have crossed in the ordinary course of business, arm's length, all that is crossed. My question is, I'm telling you that every transaction, whether arm's length, whether in the ordinary course of business or not, all of them have to scrupulously go through audit committee. I got your point. If it's at arm's length and in the ordinary course of business, should I not have an audit committee approval if that question is there? No, you should. I'm answering that very vehemently. Now, my next question which comes up to you is, what other question will you ask? A lot of private limited companies don't have audit committee. You agree? It doesn't have. Now, do you mean to say that I'm out of 188? No, I'm still there. So what should I do in a situation like that? Then the next question is, I don't have an audit committee. I'll go to the board. How simple? Board is there. So where there is audit committee as well as the board, if audit committee is there, board has to be there. And board can be there without audit committee. You agree with me? Having understood that, the, see how if you look at it like that, you get all your answers. What is there? What is not there? What if this is not there? Now, this has come to me because I've understood logic when I was doing my mathematics. And therefore, I know what questions to raise so that everything gets, every counter argument has to be answered. And you reach that stage, you will have answers to everything. Right. Now, the question is, audit committee, if it is at arm's length, and if it is in the ordinary course of business, simply audit committee approval is sufficient enough. You don't have to go to the board. You don't have to go to the shareholders. Very clear. If it is in arm's length or an ordinary course of business. Now, the corollary to that is, can the audit committee, not being able to decide, transfer it into the board, of, board meeting for the board of directors, or can it go to shareholders? If that is a question, the answer to that is very clear. Audit committee cannot shirk its responsibility. The approval has to, has to come from the audit committee only. Got the point? Now, the question comes up. Audit committee gives its approval. Board wants to reject it. What happens then? See, everything has to be answered. When you make a statement, all connected issues should be answered there. So now the question that comes up is, what happens if the board rejects? Or, or, there's also a possibility, audit committee does not give the approval, but the board will give its approval. I'll come to shareholders a little later. Now, between these two, I will tell you that there are certain decisions taken by the board will not go to shareholders. What happens? Now, the issue is very clear. Audit committee giving its approval, board has got the power of reversing it because it is superior to audit committee, right? But the audit committee rejects and the board gives its approval. Is that permitted? Why? Why is it not permitted? Because perception of the audit committee, unless it has got good reasoning, right? Audit committee should have good reasoning to state that it is accepting, not accepting. But I will counter that argument and still prove that it is arms in the ordinary course of business. If I'm able to establish, will I not have the power to do that? Will I not be able to say audit committee, I can overrule the audit committee? Then the decision is, if anything goes wrong, directors are responsible, not the people who are in the audit committee. 
if, if a fellow sits in the audit committee as well as in the board, he is open, he is at stake, if it is proved otherwise. See, look at it, how very neatly and democratically that we are moving things. Now, what should go to the shareholders? If you ask me that question, then only transactions which are material in nature will have to go to shareholders. Otherwise, why should it go to shareholders at all? See how very, very clear. It has to have materiality. Now the question comes, what is materiality? Can somebody explain what is materiality? All of us read, all of us understand what is material. And what is material for somebody may not be material for another. You agree? Yes, definitely. Now what is material? Something? No, no. First is decision making is there for all the things that happens. Do we agree on that? Anything that happens, you have to have a decision at some level. Maybe delegated uh, decision making or it's a uh, people come together and as a group they try to decide. We agree on that. Now the question is, what is materiality? Not just value, it has a significant influence on a person looking at that particular statement to do or not to do certain things. Correct? Now, the act says, I can't make you people keep thinking on that issue again and again. So they said, I will give you what are all material and what is not material and once and for all it settles the score. So that means it's so good, the law itself has come out with what is material and what is not material. So we go through that, we understand that and we live with that. So in which case it doesn't have to come to shareholders. Now, please listen. What remains with the audit committee is what is in the ordinary course of business and what is at arm's length stops at audit committee level. Doesn't have to come to the board. Doesn't have to. I'm making that point very clear. Doesn't have to come to the board unless the articles has given certain limitations to the audit committee and therefore it has to pass on to the board. Right? Otherwise, it remains there. Now, what is not at arm's length and what is not in the ordinary course of business, either both or one of them, then it has to pass to board necessarily. It may have been approved by the audit committee. It may not have been approved, but still it will come to the board. Got the point? Very clear. That's why I'm telling in the ordinary course of business, arm's length are very significant statements to be taken into consideration for some of these actions. Then, after that, if it is in the ordinary course of business, arm's length, still it is coming to the board's purview. Should it move to the shareholders, if you ask me, whether it is not in the ordinary course of business, not all that, that is not significant. When you come to shareholders, they ask, is the transaction material? What is materiality is the next thing. So very clear, we already discussed some of these issues, but then you have to lay the per uh, percentages for that. Sale, purchase or supply of any goods or materials directly or through appointment of an agent, which we have seen already, what are related party transactions. Transactions of value greater than or equal to 10% of the annual turnover or rupees 100 crore, whichever is lower. Got the point? Only if it goes beyond that, it will go to shareholders, otherwise it will not go. Then, Selling or otherwise disposing of or buying property or land and can, greater than or equal to 10% of the net worth or rupees 100 crores, whichever is lower. One talked about turnover because of transactions. Another spoke about sale or purchase of removal property. So it speaks of net worth. Leasing of property of any kind. Same way, net worth greater than or equal to 10%. 10% of annual turnover or rupees 100 crores. They have included all. Turnover also include because leasing comes under transactions also and it's also related to property so it makes up both. Then availing or rendering of any services directly or through appointment of agent so it moved from goods to immovable property to service. Transactions value greater than or equal to 10% of annual turnover or rupees 50 crore whichever is lower because services you know obviously transaction value will be low when compared to that of goods. Not necessary, not necessary, but still. So then, again, related party trans appointment to any office or place of profit in the company, its subsidiary company or associate company, all of them are related party transactions. Monthly remuneration greater than rupees 2.50 lakhs. Then, 
remuneration for underwriting all that transactions value of greater than one percent of net worth so then very recently brand usage or royalty has come into existence payment of more than two percent of the annual consolidated turnover okay very clear and we don't even have to think twice if it crosses that it has to go to shareholders you can't enshrine in your articles of association to give more power because this is the restriction placed by the company law we know that is it not anything that is in your articles of memorandum of association cannot cross what is there in the company law do we agree that's it now why are we working so much on section 180 is the procedure which is there what should you follow which i've already discussed with you now so all companies all transactions audit committee approval is required if audit committee is there you cannot cross audit committee right that's the first issue then exemption to unlist so they gave an exemption to unlisted companies or wholly owned, wholly owned subsidiaries doesn't have to go through this process at all what could be the reason that subsidiaries are covered but wholly owned subsidiary is not covered what is the reason what is the reason reason being that in the case of wholly owned subsidiary all decisions are taken anyway by the holding company and that is going to report and standalone is not important in respect of wholly owned subsidiary company because it's a consolidated financial statement it gets covered there so there there's no need for a repetition here right that's the intention is it okay then transaction in section 188 not in the ordinary course of business not at arm's length okay if it is not in the ordinary course of business not only has it to pass through audit committee but it has also to come to the board which i've already told you then transactions under section 188 in the ordinary course of business and at arm's length basis you don't have to go to the board that i've already told you and materiality crosses it goes to shareholders that's the sum and substance of all that is there here okay any questions yeah please Let me answer this question this way, that in the case of private limited companies, lot of reliefs have been given, right? Probably most of the transactions are for nature, which will get settled at the uh, board level itself. But if it is of this nature, let me tell you, honestly, it has to go to the shareholders. There's no choice. Okay, that's the answer to that. Then we understood what's a related party transaction we have understood who are those which are related parties we have understood peculiar situations and examples we have understood the procedure what more is required that's where we are coming to directors kmp responsibility and what is their function when they want to transact whether they want to transact or not they have got certain responsibilities because i won't know whether somebody is related or not, who should say that? And as auditors, I don't want to check whether this KMP has got some connection somewhere. Why should I do that? I, I'm not expected to do that. I'm expected to verify, has he made a statement? And has it been recorded? And am I, am I able to verify? These are the three issues. Now, let us assume that some of these people don't inform. All other directors are not responsible. Auditors are not responsible. Nobody is responsible except the person who has not reported. It could be a KMP or it could be a director. And therefore, it's important that they disclose this. As far as director is concerned, what is the disclosure requirement of the director? What is the disclosure? What, what, what has he to do? You have to tell me. You are speaking something. Speak loud so that I can hear. Huh. Yes. Huh. What does he do? Agreed. Disclosure of interest. What does he do? When does he have to do it? The very first board meeting of every financial year. The very first board meeting. He has to disclose his interest. It could be the same. It could have changed. He has to do it every year. Sacrosanct. He has no choice. Then, apart from that, whenever a change occurs during the year, within 30 days he has to report that. 
bring it to the notice of the audit committee because it has to go through audit committee. No choice. It has to go through audit committee if it is there. And if audit committee is not there, within 30 days, it comes to the notice of the board for recording it. Within 30 days, he has to do that. Okay. So that's the requirement. Then what about KMP? See, when we say director, it also includes all that he is interested about. Like that KMP also will have his, she or he will have. And within 30 days of their appointment as KMP, they have to report, right? Now, board considers it. Audit committee will definitely consider it. You don't have to worry. Or not, that's not important. But he's a KMP and therefore he has to report. And any change within 30 days of that, he has to do that. Right? I resist. Yeah. One by one. Now you see, very important issue I can answer, keeping what he has asked me. So when you ask questions, I can trigger something more. There are two things that can happen. Now, he is a director, correct? Then, whether or not we do any transactions with that company, irrespective, I have to report here because I am an interested party there. You know what is interested party? We are already talking about what is a related party interest. We know that. So we have to report. Whether we do transactions or not, it has to get recorded, first issue. Otherwise, how will I know? As a third person, as a third party verifying that, I won't know until he makes a disclosure and he has to disclose, first issue. Now, let's assume that I have entered into a transaction before I become a director of the company. Then I become a director. What happens? What do you do? The answer to that, yes. So, one by one. Let me tell you, I entered into a transaction and before becoming the director, it got consummated. It was closed. Will I report that? I have no obligation to report to that company if I've done a transaction become, before becoming a director. Then, if it's a continuing transaction, not only will you report of what has happened in the past, but you will also report of what is going to happen in future and get it recorded. See, every event triggers something else for us to raise a question. It's good that you raised a question and there is something more that I've answered. Right. Okay. Then a register has to be maintained. MBP4. Of course, some of these formats and other things I normally don't remember because I'm not in active practice. But then I can still say MBP4 has to be maintained and it has to be maintained for eight years. Right. Lot of forms I don't remember because I don't do work now. And in case you have entered into a transaction, Right? But then you have not got it taken to the audit committee or the board. You have got three months' time. They allow you for ratification so long as it is in the ordinary course of business and it is at arm's length. Got the point? Three months' time. You can get it ratified. Now, the question that comes up is what happens if it doesn't get ratified? What happens? So we have to all be quick. If there is no ratification, that means the company is not accepted. So what happens if the company is not accepted? Is it void? No, it is voidable. There's a difference between void and voidable. We understand. If it's void, I've been issued, it is void. There's no choice. But when they give in a three months time, then the company decides. It is not at arm's length, not in the ordinary course of business, and therefore I will not accept it, I will avoid it. Now, what is the consequence? Okay, you have avoided. it. By this time, some transactions would have taken place, company would have lost money. You know what will happen? It will be the director who is an interested party to compensate the, you should have done that before. I gave you three months time. As long as it is accepted, it is fine. If it is not accepted and I have certain things to say, you have to ensure that the loss is made good. You have to indemnify. Look. How good it is to be able to get that. A lot of us do it very casually because I was, I've been on the board for 10 years as an independent director. I know what it is. How people circumvent to do certain things. And if you stop them, all of them will become arrogant, they aggressive, they don't want to accept it. I said, no, this is the principle. And do we not 
talk everywhere else they will talk of principles but when it comes to situations like this principles are all thrown to the thrown to the wind yes you may suffer and in trying to follow what is good you are going to suffer that's my honest belief i have suffered and suffered but still principle should remain that's yes please aya yes 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 no let me tell you first is you have reported yourself to be a related party some somebody is a related party but it is also your function to ensure that it gets into the audit committee or board meeting that director is responsible not that i will seek for it i will not seek for it right or the person who is in charge she should also know because there is register open she should know that it's a related party and get it introduced for uh, decision making director is equally responsible he cannot escape and then say i have reported this for you to take care now what were you doing as a director what were you doing as a cap and these are all people who are who are going to answer the, in in some of those uh, uh, forum so the fact is that there could be transactions which could be entered with the director's knowledge himself the company some somebody else may have entered in transaction and because of gaps or errors in the process it may not have been reported to the audit committee right so in that case will the directors will be still be held responsible i will tell you is it sufficient is it sufficient to know also i know that it is in the ordinary course of business i also know its arms length is it sufficient the act says no i have certain procedures i am a company i am different from you i want you to get it recorded because i understand as a company that it is there third party should know and for that a record has to be maintained director is equally responsible that is a principle based uh, approach why should i i know that there is an audit committee i know there is a board i know that this particular transaction should go there and who will look into all this key management person will look into this directors will look into this just because one of the directors understand it doesn't mean it satisfies the condition all the people in that forum should understand and then take a decision otherwise why all this why all this i can simply report in my financial statements so that's the issue okay another question this slightly digress please go on yeah the more questions you have i'll try to answer so, uh, from a practical perspective specifically in the context of holding a subsidy so there is a frequent exchange of resources which are not recorded can you speak a little slower okay so i'm talking in context of it holding a subsidy correct where there is a frequent exchange of resources which is not recorded for example Fre frequent exchange of resources which is not recorded recorded right? Right? i mean very practical example could be that holding a um, uh, laptops in the uh, fair of holding company are deployed at the subsidiary prospectively speaking it is a leasing of resources in that sense so uh, but these are typically not recorded and the example could be an employee of the holding no, company why i will ask you a very simple question at bpos there is a common management situated elsewhere and is being shared to everybody or the uh, networking that is there is being shared with everybody if i ask that question what is your answer are you going to take only laptop or are you going to tra take transactions of that type for me principally it is a laptop or the network means the same it has to go through a process now there are also methods which are given which says don't worry about transaction wise approval i will also give you annual method of working take once decision and then keep doing that i don't want you to come back to me again and again but under these set of methods of working why can't you do that it's one time now why should you make a difference between a laptop and a network or administrative controls being there see principally you have no answer that's it you have to stop and then say principle is this and you must know company law is an administrative law it is administering you follow the principles is that okay so uh, so my question was principally yes it should be a related by it has to be done yeah lot of people don't do it that's a different issue if 99 people are wrong and one person is correct it is that one person who has to prevail now what you don't do roc doesn't ask you even in income tax unless a scrutiny comes nobody asks you 
is that the way we will behave or we will say no principally this is this please do this now you are there as a consultant in what's your ethical methods of working if you are if you if you have to answer that this is also required is that okay that's why company law said materiality means this all other things will and they also said as long as it's in the ordinary course of business audit committee or board meets minimum four times a year they will discuss that issue and close the issue and what great thing are we trying to do trying to just record it it's so good principally it is good everybody understands tomorrow i don't have a personal stake there right i can go on but then audit committee the board of directors of every listed company and following companies as prescribed in rule 6 of the company's meeting of board there is also procedures with respect to this one shall constitute an audit committee who are those who should constitute an audit committee that's why i'm coming to that all public limited companies with paid up capital of 10 crores or more listed companies definitely you look at the top the board of directors of every listed company however small it is that one plus all public limited companies with paid up capital of rupees that means those which are not listed 10 crores see what type of companies are having audit committees then rest of it is board then all public companies having turnover of rupees 100 crores or more or debentures or deposits of rupees 50 crores or more unlisted public limited companies that are wholly owned subsidiaries not to go through this procedure except for reporting by the holding company joint venturers and dormant companies are exempt joint venture lot of things we do you don't have to go through this process they have given an exemption but associate company yes gets covered exemption is not available to wholly owned subsidiaries where accounts are not consolidated you got the point because it gets consolidated including other subsidiary companies will get consolidated but 100% of the decision making process comes from the public limited company it gets recorded there therefore you don't have to record here that's all right so therefore but one thing you should remember if you ask me as a matter of principle even where it is not required audit committee may not be required but then get it recorded in your board meetings so that it brings good cleanliness into the whole system so that people understand that's the object of a board meeting or a shareholders meeting yeah ha huh. can i go directly to the board and then come back and ask the audit committee to take it on record can i do that no that cannot happen you have to go through the audit committee and then it should come to the board that's a correct method not the other way around right that's what i have told you if it's in the ordinary course of business at arms length you don't have to go to the board at all audit committee if audit committee is not there then you try to do it and apart from that audit committee cannot recommend either to the board or to the shareholders it has to give its approval or no approval whatever okay so there's no choice that you can delegate that to somebody else otherwise the sanctity of audit committee is lost yeah you can tell me to stop any anywhere sir 10 minutes more okay good now i have spoken so much would you like to ask a question if you want to otherwise i continue with my talking what is the choice continue see there are two things that can happen one is sir you have spoken so much of rubbish i have not understood how to raise a question otherwise i have understood everything what question should i raise ha huh, okay good now another interesting issue is i talked about sleeping it's not for professionals like us i go and speak to government officials poor people they are about 55 56 age now you can't expect them to sit in class and listen to my boring lecture so what do i tell them i tell them you please go to sleep don't worry there are youngsters here i'll speak to them you know what happens psychologically they will not sleep at the end of the class they tell me sir you you spoke like this in the beginning how can we ever sleep sir that is the answer so it's okay right okay uh, ah disclosures in the notice is part of the agenda all material facts see simply you cannot say there is a related party transactions and then try to give a notice that is wrong lot of notices are like that why are we doing like that don't we want the directors to understand what are we trying to ask them to decide upon whether it's audit committee or the 
lot of people don't give notices at all correct simply you call and many people don't hold board meetings at all that is also there now how good are we because we are the people who are trying to advise them help them help them to come up to those standards after that they'll all feel happy but take it from me it's once they set those systems it'll keep rolling 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 thereafter without any interference why don't we do that as professionals why can't we help them to come to that standard level whatever small is the company because these are companies which is likely to grow big and i have seen very small companies growing because systems are in place please do that have the notices explain ask them to come and actually meet help them to do that and that's an important issue and as a matter of fact ethical that this particular person who is interested in the transaction should not be present in the meeting we all understand that but that exception is there for private limited companies they have given that exception that he can participate but no other companies can do that right he can participate so long as other directors accept they can he can participate independent directors important independent directors will ensure adequate deliberations that is important very important that you have to get deliberated now why are we now simply preparing paper documents why don't we help them to do it hardly any time it will take all of them will feel happy at the end of the day that decisions are recorded and they can see the growth and all of them come to company secretaries or chartered accountants year end they want to do it like it's like preparing the accounts at the year end no no it's a practice even today and we don't allow anybody to come at the end of the year to prepare accounts with us we will not allow that is not the way engage somebody to do that work ask them to get pay that person and get things done before they come to the office that is culture that is the culture and that's the highest level of gratitude we have for the society that we don't allow things to happen just like that anyway lot of things to say but then government companies exempt from trying to get prior approval of shareholders what will happen is if at all shareholders decide also they will send it to the board or the audit committee to say please make a note of it that's it right there are a lot of reliefs to government companies because government to government nothing happens you don't have to worry members of being an rp cannot vote on any resolutions approving rpt yes if he is a related party it will not shall not apply to exceptions private limited company he can vote right 1881 then unlisted company license to operate by rbi irda or sebi interested party can vote still government companies getting approval from ministry of Dep ministry or the department they also can interested party can vote only requirement is only requirement is there should be no default in filing financial statements or filing annual returns if you do that you don't get this exception but if you are able to do that let me tell you if these people follow certain principles like what i am trying to tell you they will do that also correctly in time ensure that it is done okay what happens if the director fails to disclose okay then if there is a contravention of course there are penalty provisions and all that later but then i don't know whether i'll cover apart from that he will have to vacate the office of a director and in respect of public limited companies if they contravene not only penalty there can also be imprisonment but also they will not be able to hold the position of director for the next 5 years these are some of the especially sebi is very clear with respect to listed companies some of these things will happen i can argue each of these under accounting standard 18 accounting standard 24 and then with um, scra that is the securities contract regulation act and then again with sebi all these things they have got different issues and each of them very important why have they brought that in if you ask that principle there is a principle behind that and that's what we are supposed to respect and then get things done lot of issues are there but this is just a view to get what really is a related party transaction uh, okay then we talked about requires reporting of material probably threshold limits are already been described with respect to the shareholders meeting and they have to be in form aoc2 we will have to do it will also require disclosure of approvals dissented by the board what happens shareholders may approve 
dissented by the board board may approve dissented by the this one all those things also have to be recorded right so that has to be there disclosure has to be done auditors report where caro it's asking you clause 13 what does it say the auditors report and the financial statements of the company shall include a statement on whether all transactions with related parties or in compliance with section 177 what is 177 audit committee and 188 related party transactions where applicable and the details have been disclosed in the financial statements as required by applicable accounting standard so where do you go back now can i say that companies act is restricted but accounting standards are elaborate can i escape and then say i will follow companies act no you will have to go back and check which accounting standard is applicable to you and cover because the accounting standard today is also the creature of company law. You can't escape. Agreed? So therefore, comprehensively cover accounting standards as well, wherever required. Of course, at least I am not the one who has done audit for uh, listed companies. We have no opportunity. We are too small and people don't recognize us. That's okay. I think that's a fair enough. Maybe we don't have the wherewithal. But then wherever we try to do audit for whatever, there I think we should respect whatever is provided under law and then accordingly act. Yes, sir, you can stop me. Don't worry. If I go on, it will go on forever. Okay. Now, MB4, I've already told you. Consequences of contra contravention. Let's go through that very briefly. It is voidable. I've already told you what is voidable. And if there is any loss, indemnification will happen. Then in case of listed company, again, imprisonment for a term which may extend to one year and fine not less than rupees 25,000 and may extend to rupees 5 lakhs, 25,000 to 5 lakhs. In the case of other companies, it is restricted to fine as above without imprisonment. Every director not complying with section 89 shall be liable to fine of rupees 25,000. Then, if, if the director contravenes 184.1, 184.2, which relates to what? 184.1 and 184.2 relates to uh, where you've got uh, interested directors not reporting. If they do that, if they don't report, then in that case, vacation of office, imprisonment extending up to one year, fine of rupees one lakh or both, one more section operating, then director will get disqualified if it is a public limited company under section right for the next five years of being a director in any company, 164.1G. General penalty in case some of the contraventions do not get covered under this. Then you go to 450, 10,000, and for every one or rupees 1,000 for every day of default. Right? So this is sum and substance, a bird's eye view of what is related party disclosure. If at all I am given time, I'll take out examples and interpret how this should be looked at from different angles. Right? One is looking at AS itself. Right, AS18, in the S24, how do they differ? Right? What does SEBI expect? Then what is SCRA requirements? All these things have to be discussed. Irrespective of that, some of us are not public limited company auditors, doesn't matter. But then we are chartered accountants. Should we not know? We should know. So that's how I look at things. And uh, thank you very much for a patient hearing. It would have, I would have been happy to dialogue, but some of the issues would have not have got covered because time is limited. But then it is great talking to you people. Thank you very much. Nitty gritties of uh, related party transactions has been uh, thoroughly covered by uh, CAKS Ravi sir today, deliberating on aspects of what the regulators are looking at. And also, the responsibilities of auditors in reporting related party transactions, need for understanding the principle behind a particular provision or a rule. And uh, that was an engaging session in true spirit, sir. A teacher in you has made very clearer. Uh, CAKS Ravi, sir, said that this is his first session at C Institute. Sir, the passion, the passion you carry towards the subject and teaching and imparting knowledge this would take further more and more sessions, sir. 
uh, with crystal clear voice and fluent flow of thoughts. That calls for a round of applause, friends. On behalf of Bangalore branch of SIRC of ICI, uh, we thank you, sir. Um, can I uh, request, uh, as a, a token of gratitude and respect, can I request our senior member, C.A. Prakash Chand, sir, uh, to present a memento to the speaker? Thank you, members. Um, let us break for lunch now and then uh, reassemble sharp at 2.30 p.m. for session by CA Vijayaraja, sir. Thank you, one and all.